expert on uh, chapter 14, which is beginning of unit 6. Uh, this is called simple harmonic motion. It will detail some of the basics of simple harmonic motion and uh, set up for um, repetitive motion like waves and other things like that. First thing we're going to be looking at uh, oscillations. Oscillations are just a kind of a fancy word of saying uh, repetitive motion. So oscillations are just things that repeat motion, uh, whether it's kids on a swing as they go back and forth, you know, in each direction. Uh, that's a repetitive path, repetitive motion. Um, something like if you bounce up and down on the spring, something like that would be repetitive motion. Uh, some, you know, actually it ends up things that end up being sinusoidal in nature, and we'll get to eventually that sine equation and the wave equation that you would have uh, learned from uh, trig. Uh, we also have things that repeat patterns as in like spinning and whatever, and this is actually going to uh, link our two things that we've talked about before, like angular velocity and frequency, you know, all these kind of things like that um, together. Um, and it will make more sense when we get there. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, repetitive motions uh, on the same path can be described as an oscillation. Again, oscillation is just a fancy word for repetitive motion. Um, keep in mind, even if it's just limited to one dimension. So in this case, um, the, uh, the car right here is uh, traveling down the road. So it's traveling in this direction. This is the direction of the center mass of the car in a way. But as it travels right and left, it happens, it'll because it's a bumpy road, it'll actually you know travel up and down, right? So the up and down is the oscillation from the center point right here, you know, where it would go on a flat road. Uh, so it, it, you know it's uh, its oscillation is up and down, its repetitive motion is up and down, even though it's traveling uh, right and left. Um, so what we call this um, thing right here, where it would be a flat road right there, we call that the, uh, the e you know, equilibrium position. This is our equilibrium position, okay? Um, so it could be a, um, a lake uh, without any wind or anything, nice and flat, uh, but waves come along later. Um, something like that, or a pendulum hanging straight down, that's an equilibrium position, or a mass spring system, it's where you know, it want, that mass wants to be, or the spring wants to be. Um, but the thing is, is that there's some kind of restoring force. There has to be a force that's required in order to create this oscillation. Okay, there has to be some kind of restoring force. Uh, and what happens is that the interactions between the object's restoring force and the inertia creates oscillations. Right? So what happens is that the road pushes up on the car, let's say when it goes up, up over this bump, right? the road pushes up, um, which makes the car go up, but then something wants to pull it back down. And you can see right here, it pulls it back down, and then uh, it actually overshoots it, and then it pushes it back up, and then it comes back, and then it starts pulling it back down. But all times it wants to be at this equilibrium position. So. Uh, we'll see this in some examples of mass springs and other things like that, and it'll make a little more sense when we get to those. Uh, first, a little bit of a term review. Uh, the time required to complete one cycle is called the period. We've seen this before, and again, um, you know, like, you come here often. Yeah, I come here um, twice a week. Um, that's not uh, a period. That's actually a frequency. Right, frequency is the number of cycles per time, usually with time being seconds. Uh, so that's tw two cycles twice per week, which is the time. Um, but you know, saying that I come here every three or four days uh, is the actual period because that's the number of times you know for each cycle, which is how often I visit. You know, whatever. Uh, it could be barbershop. It could be you know restaurant. It could be whatever. Um, so we, these two we should be familiar with already. Uh, we know that they're related to each other through these equations. Essentially, if we're in seconds right here, um, I'm sorry, we're in seconds right here, then the um, uh, frequency is going to be one over seconds, and what we call that is hertz. Uh, one over seconds is um, the same thing as hertz. Um, yeah, so cycles per second is really what it is. 
Uh, object's maximum displacement from equilibrium is called amplitude. Okay, so amplitude is that if an object goes, I mean, here's, here's the equilibrium position and it goes here before it turns around and comes back this way and before it turns around and comes back this way and repeats a cycle over and over and over again, essentially the distance from uh, maximum displacement from equilibrium position like right here, that is the amplitude. Okay, that's a new one right there. Uh, you think about an amp or an amplitude as far as uh, you know sound or something like that. That's actually the maximum pressure. Um, there's different ways to evaluate that, but more amplitude, more energy, and things like that is the general way that we deal with this. Okay, in uh, in simple harmonic motion, um, we have something that travels back and forth, but it travels in a very specific way. Um, something that we call sinusoidal, uh, whether you call it sine or cosine, um, doesn't really matter, but it follows that, that path that we're used to seeing, um, you know, things before, you know, something nice sine wave. Now, it doesn't actually have to go like in this path like we saw in that car. Uh, essentially, what's happening is if I model <clears throat> the y position of this right here, all right, in time, so now this could be the y position here, and this could be an axis of time. You know, as time goes on, it goes up and down and up and down, things like that. Um, and this could be horizontal, <clears throat> and we'll see something like that uh, also. So uh, pendulums are two main, uh, is one of the main examples. We'll uh, get to that. And mass spring systems. Uh, pendulums you probably see more often than, let's say, mass spring systems. But I find that mass spring systems are easier to understand because of um, our, we got a pretty good feeling for uh, what the restoring force is uh, on those. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is going to do these, talk about these first, and then talk about pendulums uh, second, in order to probably get the best understanding as we go forward. Okay, so when we concentrate first on mass spring systems, we, okay, first of all, it's a mass spring system, so you need both. You need a mass and a spring. Um, and um, so essentially, it has to have some kind of force that creates this repetitive motion that we call restoring force. And again, it's easier to visualize this with a spring, which is why we're talking about this first. So what force wants to push the you know the mass back and forth well um, essentially we're talking about the spring force um, you, these pictures right here are their vertically hanging springs uh, it gets a little messy because we think about there's actually multiple forces you actually have weight and you actually have the spring force um, but we're eventually going to go to a horizontal you know, thing here where the spring's like this and it's going like this, and that's actually easier because you don't have to worry about the weight interacting. But the key thing is that there is a restoring force that goes on. <clears throat> so Hooke's law says that the spring force uh, is equal to negative k delta x, where this is the spring constant, and delta x is the um, displacement. Uh, again, if this is positive, then the spring force is negative which means that if you displace it to the right, then the spring force is to the left. Uh, likewise, if this is negative, that means you compress it to the left, that means the spring force is to the right. So this negative just keeps you honest with direction. And what we see here is that the spring force right here is linearly proportional to the displacement. Or the yeah, displacement, and that's, remember this is displacement from uh, the equilibrium position. Uh, where that spring wants to be. So like right here, um, this is the equilibrium position. If you just hang that spring, hang that mass off that spring, this is what uh, the equilibrium position wants to be. So probably what happened is it was hanging there and somebody came and pulled it downwards. All right, pulled it some distance here. So then it starts going, you know, back and forth and back and forth, right? Back and forth. Um, so the spring force is linearly proportional. So as this increases, so does this. But specifically, if this increases two times, then this increases two. Oh, 
two times. Uh, if this increases three times and this increases three times, so on, so on. And again, this spring constant is a characteristic of the spring that should never change um, unless you warp the spring or do something uh, bad to the spring. Um, so this is called a linear restoring force. And this is what you need. You need a relationship where if you double the uh, amplitude, essentially, that you double the force, um, you, or you, really you double displacement, you double the force, triple, triple. It has to be a one-for-one one in order to have simple harmonic motion. Uh, there is such thing as harmonic motion that is not simple, but again, that gets very complicated, which we're not going to handle in this class. Um, so one thing to keep in mind, uh, this will be helpful for some problems and just a general concept. If I if I hang um, if I have this if I didn't have this right here, uh, this mass at all, and I just hung the spring up there, uh, it would probably want to be that length right here. I mean, this is what it would look like. It would look like this, and it would be hanging right there. But I hang the mass on it, and then it stretches downwards. So it actually has now gone, and it's actually changed length. And we'll call that, you know, we call that delta x, you know, but in this case, since we're talking about length, again, it's the same kind of idea. We'll call it delta l. So the question is, how much length has it changed? Well, you got to think, okay, if I hang this here, and I let it just, you know, come to rest, well, at this point, um, you know, I, I go through all my forces. I say, what's touching my mass? All right, you say, well, there's no tensions, no whatever. There's, okay, but there is a spring force upwards. Okay, uh, so what's not uh, what's not touching my mass, but actually working on it, or acting on it? Well, that's weight actually going downwards. Force of gravity. And I say, is it accelerating? No. Okay, that means that my spring force must be equal to my weight. Okay, um, and specifically, you know, these are equal to each other and they're in opposite directions. So uh, we can express that, you know, here essentially, that um, the spring force, um, which is this, uh, but instead of delta x, we have, we're just writing delta l. These are the same things. And um, is equal to the weight. Well, we got the weight there, so on and so on. So what's the change in length? Well, the change in length is, you know, mg over k. Um, this equation right here is not so much one that, you know, you need to memorize or anything. Just know that, you know, when a, when a mass is hanging from a spring and is at rest, then these two are equal to each other, and you can get to this step pretty easy to know how much it's been stretched. Okay. Then there it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. <clears throat> okay, this is a diagram that we're going to be using, uh, and I really want you to bring this into your head um, as much as you can. Okay, so, and think about this, because this is going to be the key essential part of understanding uh, simple harmonic motion here. Um, first, we're going to start off um, saying that I have a mass spring system, so here's the mass, same mass the entire way, and here's a spring, the same spring that has a, you know, the same spring constant the entire time, that spring constant doesn't change. Um, and so uh, it's attached to a wall, and then this uh, surface right here is frictionless, right? So it's resting on here. Uh, so keep in mind that, you know, technically there's a weight and then there's a normal force, and then there's, you know, eventually there'll be a spring force and things like that. Um, but essentially these two have nothing to do with the harmonic motion, so we might as well just, you know, ignore them uh, for the most part. Okay, so we're just going to ignore these right here, and we're only really concentrating on, uh, only concentrating on the spring force and what the spring force does. Okay, so uh, let's say initially uh, something's here at equilibrium, and this is my snapshot of what happens at equilibrium. So if it's at equilibrium, keep in mind uh, that spring is perfectly happy being there. Uh, it does not want to push, it does not want to pull, it wants to just stay there, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take the spring and we're going to stretch it, all right? And we're going to stretch it this way. Some... Uh, to some new x position. So essentially this is x equals zero right here, okay? Um, 
So if this is that, then okay, get stretched to the right. Here we go. And then I am going to release it. So now this is time equals zero. Okay. So this is time equals zero. Um, okay. As I release it, um, I got to think about okay, this spring is now stretched this way. So what does the spring want to do? It wants to pull it to this this way. Okay. So it pulls it this way, and it successfully does that, and after a certain amount of time, it gets to here. Um, okay, but if I think about it right here, as it passes through right here, that spring force, that spring is perfectly happy being there. It does not want to do anything. It just wants to stay there right there. Um, but it happens to keep on going, and so as it goes, it compresses the spring, and so if it compresses the spring, that spring doesn't like it, so the spring force goes like this. And then what does it do after that? It pushes it back this way, which means it goes back through equilibrium, with spring force is zero, and then back this way. So this is how the, the spring force is providing a restoring force. That has to be linear, and it has to be whatever, but it's always going to try to push this thing towards the equilibrium. That's what, a, that's what a restoring force does. Right, the restoring force always goes towards, um, you know, uh, towards uh, equilibrium. Okay, so it always goes towards equilibrium, and it has to be, you know, li that linear proportional. Um, so yeah, so new term amplitude, you know, is the the maximum displacements from equilibrium. This is my equilibrium point right here, and um, so <clears throat> this is what happens. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to track this in multiple ways. Uh, position, velocity, uh, acceleration, um, and then eventually we'll come back and do kinetic and potential energies, but let's, let's try to track this on this uh, next slide and see what happens. Uh, first of all, um, this one right here we have is period. Okay. Um, so let's see. So initially we have start off with time equals zero. We're going to put down uh, fractions of a period through here. Well, I know that if it starts here, again, this is my equilibrium, this is my zero point in position, um, and then it goes out to some positive x here, and then goes down to some negative x here, and I, and I could, you know, dash this all the way down, but it would not be a straight line, because I can't do that. Um, then, um, it's gonna go from this position all the way here, and all the way back, which it shows like this. And so what I'm going to do is say that, okay, well, I know that's my initial point, and then this has to be my final point, and the time it takes for that is just going to be, you know, my, my period there. Okay, so if that's period, then halfway through, I've made it just to the other side, and so this is one half of the period. Okay, and, um, okay, so that means that if that's a zero and that's one half, then this is actually one quarter and then that makes this three quarters of a period. Okay, so I got that out of the way. Now let's talk about position. Uh, at that instant right here, um, by the way, on this chart, which you'll have in class, or you, you can pick it up for me if you miss class, um, you know, you can only put in three things, max positive, max negative, or zero. Okay, so, um, so right here, you know, I gotta think what position is this? Well, it's positive. Uh, and it's that's all the way to the right as far as it goes. So this is actually a max, um, a max positive. Okay. Next, as it goes through equilibrium. Okay. Well, actually, it's right here. It's at my zero position. Right. It's at my zero position. And then it makes it all the way to the other side for this right here, halfway through the cycle, and it is now at its max, max negative position. Um, Okay, now it pushes it back this way, and as it goes through equilibrium, it is now back at a zero. It's because it's equilibrium right here, zero position. And then it's been taken all the way to the right again to complete the cycle, and this is max positive. Okay, remember one cycles from the same position back all the way through and back to the same position again. Okay, next column, velocity. Um, I'm actually going to... Uh, hold on to this for a second. Let's come back to velocity and let's go to acceleration next Because acceleration is easy when you think about this F equals 
ma. Okay, so which means that my force and acceleration are proportional. So whenever I have a maximum force, I have a maximum acceleration. And by the way, these are also vectors, so the directions have to be the same too. So now instead, instead of thinking about directly about acceleration, let's think about force. And we're going to fill this out as if this was force, because that's more intuitive in our minds. So at this point, I got to think about what is the force. Well, the force is a spring force that goes back this way. Okay, so it's a spring force going to the left. Okay, so that's actually a negative force, which means that there's a negative acceleration. And it's maximum because my spring force is proportional uh, to delta x, and we're at the maximum you know, positive position here, which actually means I have a maximum negative uh, spring force. So this is actually a max negative spring force. Okay. Now as I go through here, equilibrium, it's, remember it's happy being here. I actually have no spring force at all right here. It just happens to be moving to the left. And so it actually has zero acceleration as it goes through the equilibrium. So it's not speeding up or slowing down, but it happens to have, we'll, we'll see, a, a velocity here. Okay, as it goes to this thing right here, um, okay, the spring doesn't like to be compressed, so it's going to be to the right. I can also see that if this is negative, and that's, an, you know, it's a negative and negative, that means a positive. Uh, it's all the way to the left, so this has to be a maximum force or maximum acceleration. And um, then it comes back through equilibrium, and again, it's perfectly happy being right there at equilibrium, so this is actually a zero acceleration. And it comes back to where it started, and we're back to this maximum um, maximum negative position. Okay, um, now let's think about velocity. Okay, so um, so here I had a uh, zero, I'm oh, sorry, um, I had a maximum negative, so I have this huge amount of acceleration that wants to go this way because I have a huge amount of force. So what does it do? Um, well, first of all, let's think about velocity right here. Sorry, before it gets there. Um, it was, before this, it was going to the right, and then it's going to the left. If it was going to the right, and it's going to the left, then it has to, at this maximum spot right here, have to have a zero velocity. Or you can think about, oh, it was released from rest or something like that. Okay, either way, that's fine. But from here to here, you gotta think about this entire time, you know, it's accelerating to the left. Okay, it's accelerating to the left. Right, so if it's always accelerating right here, it's picking up speed um, to the left. And uh, so actually right here, it's actually as fast just as it goes through this equilibrium position. And it's going to the left, so this is actually a maximum negative uh, velocity. Okay, now it's reached this far position here. It was going this way, and then now it starts going right afterwards. So if it was going left, and then it ends up going right, at that maximum position, you have to have a zero velocity overall. And again, from here, here, it's, you know, it's constantly accelerating to the right, because the spring force is to the right, which means that now, it, as it passes through, I have a maximum amount of positive velocity. And once it reaches back to this its initial position right here. Again, it was going to the right, and then afterwards it starts. We'll have to start going to the left, and um, which means it has a, um, which means it has a uh, zero, a zero velocity right here. If it was going to the right, and then it starts going to the left, then it'll actually be a zero velocity at this point. Sorry for that technical glitch there. Okay, so this is. The key part right here, and this is something that you shouldn't necessarily memorize, but you should think about as you know, it's important to understand. I guess you can say more than memorization, um, is how these things interact with each other. And that's why I think a mass spring system is easiest to do because you can understand this force uh, more than the gravitational one, which we'll talk about when we talk about pendulum. So let's look at this when we actually graph it. We can you can you know write this on your on your paper. Oh yeah, here are my actual answers right here, filling out here in that same order. Uh, in the worksheet that we'll do, we'll we use this. But uh, if I you know go through and I say okay, um, you know 
uh, if I have, let's see, first I'll, I'll say that position is going to be in red. Um, let's graph what we just saw. We said, okay, at the initial point, we had a maximum position, maximum positive position when time is equal to zero. Um, and I said when I got back to the same spot, which is the idea that's one period, that was also uh, a maximum positive. Um, it went from one end all the way to the other, and the other end was about halfway through, halfway in time. And we said that, okay, at, at the quarter, you know, at the quarter mark, we were at the zero position, uh, and at the three quarter mark, we were at the zero position. So I have this plotted like this, but uh, this is not like a big V, right? Because it does not uh, trace that path uh, as we would monitor it. What we'd actually see it um, do is actually, you know, um, slowly pick up speed and then then that speed decrease and then it would slowly slow down like this and then back. All right, this is a little bit off, should be a little bit like that. Okay. Um, and so this is what we would actually see right here, right, is this, uh, this path right here. It's not a straight line like this, not a straight line like this. And that actually looks like a sine curve. Actually, in this case, it's actually a cosine right here. Okay, and um, now let's go to velocity. And let's use, uh, let's use green for velocity. So green is going to be velocity here. Uh, what do we say at this initial point? It actually had a zero velocity. And so as it was all the way to the right, we let go of it at zero velocity to begin with, but as it passed through equilibrium right here, um, it actually had a maximum amount of velocity, and specifically a maximum amount of negative velocity. Okay, and then it overshot it, and it reached the far side, and as it reached the far side, it actually went back to zero velocity, right, because it was, it was going left, and then and after that it's going right. Uh, then it passes back through equilibrium, but it's going really fast, uh, and specifically really fast to the right, which means it has some kind of maximum positive velocity. And then as it returns back to its initial spot, it has zero velocity again. And so I get this right here, and this is not some kind of mountain range looking thing. This is actually a something that it doesn't change, you know, immediately. It changes with time, and then you also have a uh, sinusoidal, again, this is way off. I'm so ashamed of this one right here. Uh, I'm not even going to try. Okay. But, um, you know, it should look like this and then come down like that. There you go. That's better. Um, and it should be nice and curved and whatever. So you can always do uh, better than I can. Um, and actually, this would be, what, be a negative cosine right here. And then the last one I'm going to do is, um, say blue, I'll do acceleration. Uh, as it was all the way to the right, um, it had a maximum force to the left. So it's actually going to start way down here. It's going to have maximum, okay? As it, anytime it goes through equilibrium, it actually has zero force and zero acceleration. Uh, actually, so I know it goes to equilibrium here and it goes to equilibrium here. So it actually has zero at that point. As it is all the way to the left, that means its spring force is all, is all the way to the right, is at its maximum to the right. And then as it comes back to its original position, it has that same um, pattern as it began with. And again, this is maybe if it helps if I just do one second at a time. If I go like this, right, and that's that part, and then from here, it would go like this. Yeah, I'd like to see you do better. Okay. Um, so what I get is my three uh, methods of motion here, uh, I'm sorry, position, velocity, and acceleration, and what we see is that they are all sinusoidal, uh, all um, sines, cosines, because this is actually a negative sine right here. And for all you calculus people, you would identify that this is a uh, cosine right here, and that is position. What's the derivative of position? You'd say, oh, that's velocity. Um, and that means the derivative of a cosine is a negative sine, and that's what you see right here is a negative sine, and then what's the derivative of a negative sine is a negative cosine to get from velocity to acceleration. Mm -hmm. 
And this is the nice cleaner lines, which it should look like, but I cannot do this freehand. Okay, so now that we get that idea, and that understanding um, under our belt for um, for mass spring systems, let's go look at pendulums because pendulums are a little bit trickier. Um, so specifically, let's look and uh, talk about restoring force. Um, it was easy to think of a restoring force when we talked about mass springs um, because you know that a spring compresses and pushes and things like that. If I were to ask you what the pendulum, what makes it go back and forth, uh, you'd say, oh, gravity. And you'd be right, but I ask you to analyze it, then maybe you'd be a little bit um, stumped. Um, for example, like you know that, you could probably predict that on a space station, take the pendulum up to the space station, you pull back a pendulum, and you let go, what's it gonna do? Well, it won't do anything. So we know that gravity is responsible for this pendulum going back and forth. So what we're gonna start off with is what we need to do is to understand force, let's start off with a free body diagram. All right, good old free body diagrams. Uh, okay, so what's touching my bob here? Um, well, the string is touching it, which means I have a tension. Okay, and um, nothing else is really touching it. Uh, the only thing that's acting on it that's not touching it is a weight. Okay. And so you can say, oh, this is not balanced, right? And that actually, you know, this is not a balanced force. It creates a, an acceleration. Um, what we're going to do is, uh, since we can pick any axis we want, we're going to pick our positives, you know, we're going to have an inward kind of thing and then an outward kind of thing. And we'll, So what we're going to do is going to set a, set an axis that looks like this, all right? So now, you know, this has been pulled back a certain, you know, degrees here. And um, so essentially we have what this kind of is mirroring this right here. And um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what we got going on right now. So if I look at this, then is, this one's nice and neat and weight is the odd one. Um, and that weight can be broken into a X, you know, and into a Y. All right, so uh, what it ends up, you know, looking like is this. That you have, erase all that. Uh, so you have a free body diagram looking like this, where tension and Y component of weight are equaling each other out. And what that means is that I have an unbalanced force, which is this X component right here. All right. And so if I look at when it comes swings uh, and gets closer, if I did a free body diagram right here, it would be, um, it'd be similar. Um, so I'd have, um, make that a little better. So I'd have tension going like this now. And I would have weight Y going like this. And now I'd have weight X going like this. And so what I would actually notice is that this weight X, as it gets closer and closer, because this angle changes, it gets less and less, this weight x would actually shrink. Even to the point is right here, um, I have tension going up and I have weight going down. And there is no angle, so there's no need to break it up. Which also means at this point, this is balanced. All right, so this is balanced, which means that there is no acceleration at this point, which is exactly what we saw in the mass spring system. At the equilibrium point, there is no acceleration uh, because in that case, there was no spring force, but in this case, there is no net force uh, of, you know, where gravity or component of gravity is taking it back and forth. All right, if I let this go and go through a cycle, now I see on this side, I have the same thing. I have, uh, I'll go ahead and break this up. Like, here's my axis like this. Oh, it does not like when I double click. So let's go fix that. All right, uh, so here's my axis right here, and uh, which means that tension goes this way. Um, I'll go ahead and break up my weight X and weight Y. 
already broken up. And so again, these two cancel each other out. And so this is um, this is your this is your restoring force right here. And if I got right here, it'd be the same thing where I had tension going like this. I would have weight y going like this, and then I would have a smaller restoring force as you get out here. So what I see is that this x component, or really a component of the weight, is the restoring force. Okay, and that um, um, that it actually gets less and less as you come in, which is the same thing as, as a spring, exact same thing. And that's what I'm trying to get to here. So let's go on, next slide here. Okay, so what happens is that the tangential, if this is like a circle, then the tangent, right, this x is always providing a tangent, right, if you consider this kind of circular. Um, instead of calling it x, you can just call it tangential weight or something like that, uh, can always be found by using mg sine theta, with theta being the angle of displacement, right? So instead of displacement being in the mass spring system, you know, um, instead of displacement being, um, you know, some, you know, zero and positive x and negative x, we have, now have, you know, this is my zero angle, and this is some positive theta, and this is some negative theta when it's out here. All right, so theta is actually what we base our displacement on for pendulums. Um, and so this is this this component of the weight right here is the restoring force. And uh, this is actually a linear restoring force. Although you think about this, if I double this angle, then you'd want this to double, but this is a sign, so let's, let's, let's work through this a little bit. Uh, first of all, this is our chapter of radian mode. So let's change our calculator to radians. Make sure I am in radian mode. I am not, so let's change it. All right, I am in radian mode now. Now, first thing I need to do is change these angles uh, into radians. So this is like an angle that I pull back here, uh, let's say 45 degrees, 30 degrees, whatever. And let's, you know, change these into radians. Because what I want to show that is that this is essentially, this is linear, which means if I double this, then I kind of almost pretty closely double this. Um, so first thing, I want to change 45 degrees uh, into radians. So that only 45 degrees into radians. Um, so I do like this. So let's go 45 degrees. How many degrees are in uh, per radian? Well, the easiest thing to think of is 360 degrees is 2 pi radians. And so essentially what would happen is degrees would cancel and I got radians left. Um, so, or you can use pi over 180 or whatever. So I'm going to change this 45 um, times 2 pi divided by 360. And so this is roughly 0 0.7853. Uh, Again, I, I, want, I want these decimal answers right now. Okay. Um, Let's see, this is, if that's this, then this would be, let's repeat that again, for 30 degrees. So this is 30, and this is 0 0.52, um, 5, 6-ish, whatever, close enough. Uh, 15 degrees would be actually half of that, so divide by 2 and 0 0.2618. Okay, 10 degrees, um, go back to 10. Uh, 0 0.1745. Uh, and then five degrees would be half of that. So getting down low, 0 0.08727. Uh, okay. 
Now I'll have these in this all these degrees and radians. I, again, it's easier to think about degrees, but for this analysis, we need we need this to be in radian mode. Okay, so we're going to take the sign of this answer, these answers. So I'll go back up here, and um, so I'll say, okay, sine of 0.7853 is uh, that is actually 0 0.70. 7, 1, which is, there's a difference, you know, here, there's a difference, so let's, let's keep on going down the list and see, you know, what we see, uh, so sine of 0.5235, or 6, really, um, will give me, okay, that's exactly 0 0.5, uh, it makes sense, sine of 30, I, I guess I should have known that. Sine of 30 is 0 0.5. It doesn't matter if it's in radians or not. Um, so that's about 0 0.5. So, so here we got uh, 0 0.08 dif uh, difference. So essentially here we got 0 0.02. So actually that difference is getting less and less. Um, now I'll do sine of, um, of 15. Uh, sorry, yeah, 15 degrees. And uh, which is in radians. So we're in 0 0.5. Um, two, five, eight, eight. Wow. Okay. So now we're actually pretty close. We're point zero zero three. So that's the difference of point zero zero three. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, so that's actually getting pretty darn small difference between this and this. And then right here, if I keep on going, then it'd be sine of um, 0 0.1745. And this is actually getting to be a very small difference in 1736. And point now we're at a difference of 0 0.0009. And um, oh, Sorry, my zeros over here. Um, and so that's actually pretty small. And then lastly, um, sine of that divided by 2. And this gives me a value of 0 0.087. Oops, 7, 1, 4. Okay, so 4. Sorry, my pin got a little lost there. Um, so yeah, so this is actually pretty... Pretty small differences. These are significant. But these are actually pretty small. And so what I'm trying to say is that whether I use theta, sorry, whether I use sine of theta or whether I use theta itself, if I double the angle right here, theta, uh, then you can see how this would double it here. It actually doesn't matter if I stay if I stay under 15 degrees. So that's my rule that changing the angle under 15 degrees of displacement under 15 degrees, which is this many radians, um, creates a linear restoring force. If I go above that, it's no longer linear because uh, doubling uh, these kind of things don't necessarily double. So uh, 15 degrees is gonna be my magic, uh, magic angle. Somewhere around here, uh, things get pretty darn close and I can use theta instead of sine theta. So that's a lot of complicated analysis, but it's important to prove why and you know that 15 degrees is there as that as that value, and that the um, and that the uh, uh, gravity is a restoring force that is linear. So that's close enough. Okay, um, and whatever I use here, and again, this is my restoring force for a pendulum. Uh, whatever I use here must be in radians. Um, doesn't work for degrees. Okay, so make sure that's this value is in radians. Okay. Um, okay, so if you notice here, this is a uh, mass right here. Um, so if mass really doesn't factor into the pendulum's motion, which we found from the from the lab, uh, then why is it in this equation? Well, this gives you the restoring force, but not the restoring, necessarily, the acceleration. So the acceleration, again, because these masses will cancel, um, will actually go through there. Uh, 
Uh, the pendulum also makes the same sinusoidal motion, the same um, plots, the same positive and negative position velocity acceleration, you know, pulling it to the right initially, you know, this position is the same as, um, you know, this position. Where if this is equilibrium here, and this is positive x right there. So those, those are actually the same uh, here, it's just, um, uh, yeah, so these are the same here, same idea at that. Okay, if I look at this, uh, now that we have uh, the description of those two things uh, taken care of, let's look at this and try to start doing things mathematically here. Uh, first of all, uh, if I have a position of function of time, so what I said, I said that this right here is my position one, and I can see that that actually looks like a cosine. Well, okay, cosine, and the, if I actually remember back to my trig, I have all this stuff, cosine, and then the uh, value of this is the maximum positive. Well, what do we call that? We call that the amplitude, right? So this maximum positive is the same thing as saying the you know positive amplitude. What does that make this? Negative amplitude, okay? Uh, so the amplitude times the cosine and this right here uh, can be represented multiple ways. I could call this uh, 2 pi times frequency because what's 1 over period is frequency. Uh, I could also say, well, okay, what's, what is 2 pi? That's the angle in a circle. And what's period? It's the time to go you know, in a circle, let's say that. So this is actually the same thing as that. So I could actually represent this as you know, omega t. So a cosine omega t, right? That's also uh, fine also. Or I could put this in there, or you know, or I could leave it the way it was. Um, so velocity, well, we said, okay, that's, it starts off with zero velocity and drops down like this. Uh, so if it starts from zero, that's gonna be a sign, but it drops down from there, so that needs to be a negative sign. So what ends up happening is that um, we're not talking about uh, maximums with position here, we're talking about maximums with um, um, velocity. So we have a sign, and again, this could also be represented, <clears throat> you know, these two other ways. <clears throat> and um, so this is instead of a amplitude or positive or negative amplitude, this is a positive um, or you know maximum velocity here. And then I go to acceleration, which is this third one right here. And um, so this starts off with a maximum negative acceleration, eventually goes to maximum positive acceleration, and so on, and so on. And um, this is now a cosine, but it is a negative cosine. So this is what we have here. And again, this is the same as what we said up there. I can say that it's two pi frequency, or I can say two pi over period is omega angular velocity. All right, so this is what I have here. And the calculus people should say, oh, that makes sense. All right, derivative of this gives you, derivative of cosine gives you negative sine, derivative of negative sine gives you a negative cosine. The only thing that they would be baffled about is like, what does this mean out here? And we'll get to that. So using these equations, I can predict the position, velocity, and acceleration of an object in simple harmonic motion at any time. So give me a time and the period and the amplitude, and I'll tell you exactly where the position is. Right? Or you can give me a position at any time, and um, give me that time, give me the amplitude, and I can find the period, any, any of these values right here. Same thing with velocity, same thing with acceleration. Uh, the thing is that you, this is where we go into radian mode. This must be in radians in order for that to happen. And again, it doesn't matter if it's a mass spring system, it doesn't matter if it's a pendulum, it doesn't matter if it's a buoy, a wave, uh, anything else like that. Um, these three equations can apply. So here's an example here. Uh, an air track glider essentially just means that it's a, um, um, a mass spring system uh, something without friction. Imagine like a um, air hockey table. I'll say it's horizontally on a spring that has a frequency of 0 0.5 hertz. So let's draw this. Here's my mass spring system. It's on this air hockey table, so there's no friction right here. And it goes back and forth from this position to this position being negative x and 0 and positive x. 
Okay, so it has a frequency of 0 0.5 hertz. Suppose the glider was pulled by 12 centimeters. So this is now, actually I know that this is, is pulled, so it's by 12 centimeters, so it's 0 0.2 meters, uh, and then released. Well, where will the glider be at one second? So I'm gonna use my time is equal to one second. Notice that that's where I'm gonna evaluate for. Uh, that's not my period, because that's, you know, obviously not. Uh, and what is the velocity at this point? Okay, so let's let's go through here. Um, first, where will the glider be after one second? So I'm looking at position. So if I go to that last slide, I got position versus time is equal to the amplitude cosine. Um, since I'm given frequency, I'm going to use this version, right? Because one over period is the same uh, times time. Okay. So what is the amplitude? Well, if it's pulled back 12 centimeters or 0.12 meters and then released, it's going to go back and forth and the amplitude, right, is the maximum distance from, you know, from, uh, from equilibrium right here. So it's going to go back and forth right there. And uh, so that's going to be 12 centimeters also. So the amplitude is 12 centimeters or 0 0.12 meters. Uh, and multiply by the cosine of 2 pi, and the frequency was given to me as 0 0.5, okay, and, and that's in hertz, um, and then the time was well, given to me as t. All right, so close this off here, so that means 0 0.12 meters, uh, let's think about it, so this is 1 half of 2 pi, um, that means pi, um, and then this is one, um, so actually, yeah, I didn't put it in there, but this should be, this should be one, put that in there now. Um, so I end up with cosine of pi. Hmm, cosine of pi is actually negative one, right? So this is actually negative one. Um, it's the same thing as cosine 180. Uh, which is negative one. And so what I end up with is negative 0 0.12 meters. So actually what happens is that um, if I would have also looked at this, this period was one over frequency. So one over one half is uh, two. So it takes two seconds to go there and back. So the question is where is, it, where is it at one second? Well, it's halfway there, halfway in the cycle. So it's actually on this far other side, which gives me the same idea right here. Okay. Um, so where is it? Where will? Check. Done. Uh, what's the velocity at this point? Oh, actually, um, so I could, let's, let's go through, let's go through this. Let's just have fun and do this. Um, well, okay, I have to know negative uh, Vmax sine of 2 pi frequency times time. Uh, I don't know this, but what I do know is that, uh, and just, let's just go ahead and plug in just in this sign, 2 pi, uh, my frequency is 0 0.5, the so time is 1, right? So it's time is 1, so what is the sine of pi? And that sine of pi is 0. So it actually will have zero frequency, uh, sorry, zero uh, speed at that time. And I knew that conceptually because, you know, it was going this way and then it ends up going this way afterwards. And if it was going left, which is negative and ends up going positive, it must go through a zero speed at this point. So this one I can actually, you know, do also uh, either mathematically or conceptually too. Um, so. Um, the one thing that was kind of left over from the last uh, couple slides that you didn't know is this. Again, that last problem, if I was given anything else, um, I wouldn't know what Vmax actually was. Um, so I couldn't have solved for that maximum velocity without that concept or without the idea that this, you know, sine of pi, whatever, goes to zero. But that was a nice, simple, straightforward uh, problem.
the issue is what if uh, what if I don't have this, right? What if I don't know that and there's no concept to answer it? Or there's no nice and neat stuff. And again, I, I have this written like this, but again, yeah, I could write it like this so it all matches the same here. Either way. Um, so what's the what's this value up here? A, well, that's A is the amplitude, which is the maximum position, positive or negative, whatever. So that's actually easy to understand. Um, but what is this right here? This is actually 2 pi frequency times amplitude. 2 pi frequency times amplitude. And if you're a calculus person, then you have the ch -ch 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 chain rule, right? And so you have, you take the derivative of the outside, then you take the derivative of the inside with respect to time. This 2 pi f pops out right here, and you get 2 pi f times a, and so on and so on. If that's calculus is your thing, then that's, you know, of course, the reason why. And um, so otherwise you have to just memorize that this is two pi f a. Uh, acceleration, the maximum acceleration is two pi f, but that gets squared times a. a is not squared, but two pi f uh, is squared. And what it ends up being again is when you take the derivative of this, you get the negative cosine, then you take the derivative of the inside and get another two pi f that pops out and joins the previous 2 pi f to make 2 pi f squared. Now, these are not, you know, easy necessarily to memorize. It's all full of Greek. It's all done whatever. Um, if you can start with this, right, and say, okay, uh, then this goes from cosine to sine. Positive here goes to negative. So those are opposites. Um, a goes to, well, 2 pi f a uh, instead of v max. Um, and then from here, you go from sine to cosine, so that changes. Uh, you go from negative, oh, actually it stays the same. And then this is just 2 pi f squared times a. So. Either way, you're going to have to you know, internalize this in some way, and maybe just writing it down a bunch will help. So let's do an example here. A wooden toy suspended vertically from the spring. If you lift the toy up by 10 centimeters and let go, it will complete four oscillations in 10 seconds. What is the oscillation frequency? When does the toy reach its maximum speed? What is the speed? What are the position and velocity four seconds after the toy is released? So let's draw a toy here. And this is the position it wants to be at. And it is lifted up to this position here. So this position is x or y equals zero, it doesn't matter. And then what it you, look, you drop it from here, which I'll call this um, 10 centimeters or 0 0.1, 0 0.1 meters. And you drop it, and what happens is it goes all the way down again. It doesn't like my double clicks accidental. It's a negative 0 0.1 here. Okay. Okay. Um, and it says, what is the oscillation frequency is the first one. Uh, okay, so it's given to me as four oscillations in 10 seconds. Remember, uh, frequency is always going to be cycles per second. So frequency is actually going to be oscillations or cycles per second. So that means um, four oscillations in 10 seconds. So that actually comes out to be 0 0.4 hertz. It's a little shortcut right there. Um, cycles per second, so I do divide those. Okay, so it says, when does a toy reach a maximum speed? What is the maximum speed? Well, if I go back a slide right here, so um, first, let's answer what is the maximum speed? Well, the maximum speed is equal to two pi frequency times amplitude. Okay, so actually, let's, let's do that, so V max, is equal to 2 pi frequency times amplitude. Okay, 
And um, so this is 2 pi, and then it's frequency. Well, I just found that at 0 0.4. And the amplitude I found was 0. Point, oh, amplitude given to me, um, sorry, from the problem. Clean this up a little bit. Amplitude given to me from the problem is uh, 0 0.1. Uh, so let's multiply those together. 2 pi times 0 0 0.1, 0 0.4. And I get a maximum velocity of 0 0.25 and 3 sig figs, I'll make it 251. And that's going to be in meters per second. Okay. So what is the speed? Right. I don't know direction, it could be going to the right or left, but at, at any point, this is your maximum speed that goes on, the maximum speed of velocity here. Uh, it could be going to the right, it could be going to the left, at that. Uh, the question becomes, when does the toy reach that maximum speed? Okay, um, I have multiple routes here. Uh, one route is I could take this and I could find the period. Uh, so the period would be one over frequency. Um, so I don't want to do any quick math in my head, so that's 10 over 4, but either way, 1 divided by 0.4 is 2.5. So 2.5 seconds uh, is the time it takes to go from here, all the way here, and then all the way back. Um, so when does it reach the maximum? Well, it will reach it actually as it's coming through the equilibrium. This always has a maximum speed right here. So if actually this entire period is 2.5, then a quarter of the way through the cycle, right, it'll reach it. Uh, it'll also reach it at three quarters of the way through the cycle. Uh, so actually, just doing that real quick, I can find that um, 2.5 divided by 4 would be at t equals 0 0.625 seconds. And then as it comes back around, it would actually be uh, times 3. Uh, 1.875 seconds. And that's the power of kind of logic as you go through. Uh, but let's do this mathematically. Uh, when does it do it? Well, if I go to my equation, my velocity at any particular time is equal to V, oops, um, is equal to V max. All right, so, um, so V max, I'm sorry, negative V max, um, and then this is going to be, let's think about it, sine 2 pi f times t. Uh, and I want to solve for this t, right? So that's what I'm solving for. Um, okay, so it says at what time essentially is the maximum speed equal here, right? So when, when are these two equal to each other? Well, when these two are equal to each other is when sine and again, the values, we're just looking at the speeds, right? So this positive and negative really doesn't matter for us, uh, is when this sign of this value is equal to one. If this is one, right? If this is one, then these two are equal to each other. That whatever speed it is, is the maximum speed. So when is this, so what I'm gonna do is say, when is this two pi, and I'll plug in my frequency of 0 0.4 times t, when is this equal to one? Okay, so it's equal to one, and let's, I can actually I do inverse sine of each one. So I do um, so two pi. If I do inverse sine on both sides, uh, zero point four is t sine negative uh, one. Uh, let's see, do my calculator stuff here. This side is 1.5707. Uh, 2 times pi times 0.4 is 2.513 times t. And if I do now this answer, if I use my unrounded divided by my last answer, if I use unrounded, and I get, wow, 0 0.625 seconds, okay? Uh, but it's also, um, because it's sine, it occurs at multiple spots, depending on as this time increases like that.
Okay, so that's when uh, that, that happens. It says, okay, the last one, what are the positions and velocity four seconds after the toy is released? Ah, it's getting long. Okay, let's see if I can fit it into this right here. Okay, four seconds. Um, I know my entire period is, so it actually would go past here and then come back this way. Uh, there's no logic thing I can use for this. I just have to use straight math. So, um, so what's the position at a certain time? Uh, that is the amplitude times cosine. Um, and I, I'm going to start using 2 pi times 0.4. Um, you know, that's 2 point, yeah, 2, well, I probably should have done, sometimes it's convenient just to go ahead and calculate 2 pi frequency is 2 pi times 0 0.4, because you use it a lot. I used it here, then I used it here. Um, I probably should have done this earlier, 2.51, um, 3 or something like that. Um, okay, so 2 pi f times t. Um, amplitude was 0 0.1 cosine and then uh, what you know this 2 pi f which I had just up here uh, 2.513 and then times the time of 4 seconds. And that equals what? So I say 0 0.1 times I already got it stored, so I'll say, cos I'll say cosine, and I'll say answer uh, times 4. And I get a position of negative 0 0.081. So that's actually pretty close to equilibrium here, right? So... Actually, no, I'm sorry. This is negative 0.1, so it's, it's probably around somewhere around here. Uh, I would actually expect to have a negative velocity right here, so I've got to make sure that that is uh, going to be true. So let's find its, um, let's find this right here. That's going to be negative uh, Vmax. And remember, it says a velocity, so I need to indicate that direction also. Uh, negative Vmax, and this is going to be sine of... 2 pi f times t. Um, okay, so v max I already found was um, negative 0 0.251. Um, and then I do sine of uh, well, 2 pi f was 2.513 and uh, times time of 4 seconds. Okay. All right, so let's do that now. Point, uh, so I say negative um, 0.251 times sine of 2.513 times 4. Oh, actually, it, I forgot. It does not have to be. It just shows this position. It could be going this way or it could be coming back this way. So in this case, I know that it is actually coming back because I have a positive 0 0.147 meters per second. So there's a lot of work in this problem right here, and a lot of thinking. Sometimes it can be shortcuts, sometimes just thinking like, oh, okay, well, when is my maximum velocity? Well, I have to set these two equal to each other. Essentially, when is these two equal and these, you know, when is sine equal to 1 or something else like that. So a lot of work that can be done. It can be a little bit complicated in this section. Uh, now let's think about energy uh, specifically. Um, so energy and harmonic motion. Uh, so we see a cycle of when I pull this, I stretch it. Uh, I store energy in the spring. And when I let go and it passes back through equilibrium, it no longer has any of that spring energy. So what has happened, all that spring energy has been converted to kinetic. But that keeps on going, oh, sorry, keeps on going to the left, all right? So as it goes to the left, it compresses the spring, which then stores energy again. 
Um, and then it just goes back and forth between stored energy and kinetic and stored and kinetic and stored and kinetic, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. Uh, if there was no friction, then the total amount of potential and kinetic energy, what we call mechanical energy, is conserved. And it will just repeat forever and ever and ever without any stop. Um, also, the spring would have to be ideal where it doesn't absorb energy of its own, which also would happen um, if, you know, in reality. So again, I get the same thing I can think about. Store maximum potential energy, lose all that to kinetic, kinetic shoots it past, store that energy again. And so what I end up looking at is these last two columns. At the far right, right here, I have zero kinetic energy, but I have a maximum potential energy, right? Maximum amount of stored energy. Here I have uh, no potential energy, right? And I have a maximum amount of kinetic energy. Um, notice that there is no positive, positive and negative here, because again, uh, you can't have negative uh, kinetic energy or anything else like that, and potential really doesn't really care about whether the spring is compressed or stretched, it's all the same either way. And so we just go cycles back and forth between having those. So if I actually look at this, it would be, you know, something like this, where my kinetic energy, say in red, uh, starts off at zero, because I have no kinetic energy to begin with. It also means that it's going to end up at zero when I finish the cycle. Uh, as it see passes through equilibrium, um, it has a maximum amount of kinetic energy. Uh, and then as it comes back halfway through the cycle, it's now on the other end. It actually has no kinetic energy because it's now changing direction, it has no velocity at that point. And as it goes through equilibrium, I now have a maximum amount of kinetic energy again. And again, this isn't some mountaintop thing. I'm not even gonna, actually, I'm not even going to try to line those up because it's too much for this tablet. Uh, for me to try to do that. So uh, you just laugh at me. So what I'm going to do is now do potential. I'm going to make that potential blue. And my potential, well, it starts off with a fully stretched spring. So string springs that are stretched have um, potential energy. This is elastic potential, of course. And But what happens is it passes through equilibrium. It no longer has any potential. And then it goes all the way to the other side, which means it stores energy from that compression. And then it goes back to equilibrium, which means it has no more spring energy. And then it comes back to here. All right, so what I see is this right here. That is my potential. This is my kinetic. All right. But what I notice when I want to go and find what mechanical is, well, mechanical is just, is always my kinetic plus my potential. That's what mechanical is. So if I add this and this, then I get, oh, well, this is that value. Again, I add this and this, I get that value also. So I know these peaks right up here, always right there. I want to add those together. And then again, these are supposed to be on the same line right there. Um, but if I notice right here, like if I, if I add, you know, that kinetic and that potential, I get, you know, twice as much here. And I also get twice as much here. It ends up being, of course, as we said, if there's no friction, mechanical energy is conserved. So the total mechanical energy stays the same the entire time. Um, so that doesn't actually change if there's no friction or air resistance or if it's an ideal spring. So that's, a, that's an important thing uh, also, is that there's a cycle back and forth. And you actually notice that this would be what a, a sine squared and a cosine squared or something else like that. And then, of course, that would depend on, you know, your velocity for kinetic and potential here. That would go into those energies and using the wave equations from before. Um, some details here when we talk about uh, actually calculating uh, given a certain setup, the period of a pendulum. Okay, um, as we found in our lab, the only things that affect the period of a pendulum is the length, and really that's the only thing that you could have came up with. Um, there were small effects about angles, and of course most of that was be when you, when this angle was greater than 15 degrees, 
as you went farther and further back, and some people probably took it all the way out to 90, right? Um, you saw a little bit of effect, but it was usually pretty minor in general. That's because that restoring force is nonlinear past that point, although it's pretty pretty darn good. Uh, and then the other one is gravitational acceleration. Again, you didn't you couldn't you couldn't change that. You couldn't go to the moon. You couldn't go to another planet or anything else like that. You're limited to our classroom. Okay, so this is the equation right here. Now the biggest issue here is just going to be algebra, right? For us and you know for the planet, this is going to be 9.8. Um, this is the length. Uh, keep in mind that it's always this length is always from the center of mass of the bob to the pivot point, right? So keep in mind if this was some kind of odd shape, let's say it was, um, oh, I don't know. Well, okay, let's, let's imagine this is a big, huge wrecking ball, and then somebody came and then sat on top of the wrecking ball like this, All right? Um, let's say it's a pretty massive person, uh, so the actual center mass would go from here, the geometric center, to somewhere up here now. So that length has actually shortened. And supposedly that's what happens actually when you swing and you pump your legs, all that stuff like that. You're changing your center of mass and you're changing the length by leaning back on the chain and all that stuff and you're changing the period of the pendulum when you do that. Okay, let's go back to red here. Um, for a mass spring system, uh, we didn't do a lab on this, but um, what you would see is that <clears throat> the uh, amplitude, how far you stretch it back and forth, really doesn't matter. Um, what So what happens is the more I stretch it, the more force there is, which means that there's more acceleration this way. You know, the farther, farther I stretch it. So it actually covers that ground uh, regardless with the amplitude. Uh, gravity doesn't affect this, and actually it doesn't matter if I hang it you know, vertical like this too, right? Same thing, it doesn't matter which planet I'm in, or if I'm on a space station with no gravitational acceleration at all, if I just do like this, it'll actually just do all the same. Only thing that affects it is how much mass is on here, and the spring constant or the quality of the spring. So these are the only two that affect it. And it's the exact same format as we had in that last slide too. Um, two pi equals square root of m over k is the period. Okay, example. A spring has an unstretched length of 10 centimeters. Uh, 0.2, uh, sorry, 25 kilogram mass is hung from it, which by the way, I'm gonna go ahead and cheat and go, not cheat, but I'm gonna go ahead and declare that. That is 0 0.025 kilograms. I need this to be in kilograms. Stretching it to a length of, and again, this should be 0 0.1 meters, and this is now 0 0.15. If the mass is then pulled down or released so it oscillates, that means it goes back and forth, what will be the frequency of the oscillation? Okay, so I have, it's hanging, right? The spring is, let's say this is my spring right there, and it wants to be uh, 0 0.1 meters. But when I hang a mass from it, it stretches out, and it is now... Uh, 0 0.15 meters. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I hung from and stretching to length. Okay. Okay, so um, so I know this. Uh, I know that it begins to oscillate. So I'm, I'm going to be asked to find the frequency. Um, but the only equation I have is this one. Okay, the only one I have is this one. This finds the period, but if I know if I can find the period, then the last thing I'll do is frequency is one over period. Okay, so if I can get to this period, then I, I'm okay. So let's start plugging in our values. So period is equal to two pi, square root, uh, mass in kilograms is 0 0.025 kilograms. And that's going to be divided by the spring constant. And, oh, I'm not given the spring constant. 
Okay, so I'm going to use this situation right here, this story. And I have this math right here. That's hung for me. Okay, so at this point right here, what's actually happening is I have weight pulling down, but I have a spring force pulling up. Um, so it's hung, and this is its new length. Okay, it's not oscillating yet. So these two are going to be in equilibrium and equal to each other. So that means my weight is equal to the spring force. So my weight is equal to if I get my directions in there, whatever, um, is k. We're just looking for a value here for k, so delta x. Um, so weight is mg, and then k is what I'm trying to look for. Delta x is going to be my final minus my initial. Okay, so, so let's start plugging this in. My mass is 0 0.025. G is 9.8, um, K is what we're looking for, and then uh, delta X here is this right here. So how much has it been stretched? Well, it was this and now it's that, so it's actually been stretched 0 0.05 meters. All right, so let's solve for K now, and that's going to be 0 0.025 times 9.8 divided by 0 .00, uh, 0 0.05. And so my K is actually uh, 4.9. This is actually Newtons per meter. So now I know this, 4.9 Newtons per meter. Okay, so now I've got to find period. So 2 times pi times the square root of 0 0.025 divided by 4.9. And again, your mass should never be negative. Your spring constant should never be negative. So um, you should always get a nice clean answer there. So I actually get a period of 0 0.44, oops, uh, 44, 0.449 seconds. And so the question is, what is the frequency? Well, that's just 1 over 0 0.449, or better yet, just use your remainder in your calculator. I say 1 divided by the answer. And that gives me 2.23 um, hertz. So it goes 2.23 cycles per second, and each cycle takes 0 0.49. Uh, 0 0.449 seconds. Okay, uh, next one. A 1.5 kilogram mass slides across a horizontal frictionless surface at a speed of 2 meters per second. Let's go back until it collides with its uh, collides and sticks with the free end of a spring with a spring constant of 50 newtons per meter. The spring on the other end is attached to a wall. How far is the spring compressed when the mass instantly comes to a rest? Uh, which means instantly, which means at that instant is at rest. So let's draw uh, mass spring system here. I got a wall spring like this, and so what happens is it's initially this long. A mass comes in, and we know this is uh, one point five kilograms and this is I'll just make this positive two meters per second. So what happens is it comes in, it hits, and what's it gonna do? It's actually gonna compress uh, this spring. So I'm gonna show the spring compressed. So it was right here. Actually I probably should indicate that it was right here. Okay, it does not like double clicks. Stop doing those touches. Um, so it was right here, and then it compresses to a point right here. As it remember, it comes to a rest. So it actually has this is my equilibrium position of zero, its rest length, and then it reaches some some positive compression or whatever here. 
Okay, how far is the spring compressed when the mast instantly comes to a rest? So this is still 1.5 here. So let's think about strategies. Languages. First, forces and kinematics. I have kinematics here. I know that my initial velocity is 2 meters per second. I know my final velocity is 0. Uh, this is, again, as it's kind of hitting right here. Um, if I can draw this kind of like this, whatever. Um, and so, okay, so I can find a delta x. But the difference is, is that my force is my spring constant. And that actually depends on the position. Right? So the more it's, it's pushed, the more that the force is, which means that the more that the acceleration is. So that actually is nonlinear. I cannot do that without calculus. You could do it fine with calculus, but uh, we can't do that. Um, okay, so forces and accelerations out. Uh, momentum and energy. Oh, there seems to be a collision here. And I could use conservation of momentum, but um, that's, you know, basically there's an outside force, which is the spring. And you would need to know, uh, in order to do an impulse, you'd have to do force and time. Uh, you'd use an average force in the spring, which is possible to do a change of momentum. Uh, but you don't know time, so I can't do that. Um, last language, uh, energy. Okay, that means the total amount of energy in, when I do the mass and spring system, must be equal to the total amount of energy afterwards. Uh, otherwise saying that this block had kinetic energy on this right here, and this before it had kinetic energy. Now it has no kinetic energy, but it has spring energy. So all that kinetic energy has been converted into um, spring energy. So that's what I'm going to use. I'm going to say all my energy initial must be equal to all my energy final. Uh, there's no outside work between uh, besides the, um, the spring. So what kind of energy do I have initially? I have kinetic from the mass. And what kind of energy do I have finally? Um, I have, oops, this is not gravitational. I have um, elastic or spring or whatever you want to call it. So let's see, this is one half m initial velocity squared is equal to one half k delta x squared. Um, one halves cancel. Masses can't cancel. It doesn't work. I know my mass was uh, 1.5. I know my initial speed was 2. And that's going to be equal to my spring constant, which I know is 50 newtons per meter. And what I'm trying to find is actually this delta x right here. How much has it changed? And that's going to get squared. So if I solve for that, um, it's 4. It's a 2 is 4. 4 times 1.5 is 6. 6, uh, so 6 divided by 50. And take a square root of that. Oops. And I get a delta x of um, 0 0.346. Sure. Um, and that's going to be in meters. Okay, now it says, how much time does it take the, it to come to rest? Well, essentially, after it's attached to the spring, uh, let's say it's, you know, and it really does attach, it's basically in, we'll start like a periodic motion. Let's say it's Velcroed or whatever after it hits. And it'll just go back and forth like this. So, really, if I know, if I could find the period of that oscillation, then I can understand how long it would take to get from here to here as a fraction of the entire period. So let's find the period first. Uh, 2 pi square root of mass over k. So it's 2 pi, the mass is 1.5. And the spring constant was 50. So it's 2 pi square root of 1.5 divided by 50. And I get a period of 1.0883 seconds. Okay. 
Now I gotta think about what fraction. So an entire period from here to here would go all, I mean, so for, go from here to there and then back to where it started. So that's, an, that's one entire period. So it'd go one quarter, two quarter, three quarter, four quarters. So this is actually a quarter of a period. So the time I'm interested in for it to take would actually be a quarter of a period. So I take this number right here uh, and divide by four. So I take that answer divide by four. And I get that it would be 0 0.272 seconds. Okay. A uh, pendulum clock is designed um, so that one swing of pendulum in either direction takes one second. Um, what is the length of the pendulum? Okay, so if it goes from here to go one swing over here, this takes one second. Um, but keep in mind that's not the actual period. The period is to do one complete cycle. And a cycle is here and all the way back. So actually the period is twice that amount, two seconds. So this tick, top, tick, top, all right? So I know that my period is equal to two pi square root of length divided by g. And that's, so that's two pi, oh sorry. Okay, so we're gonna go from here. I know my, this is two seconds, uh, two pi right here. My length is what I'm trying to solve for. And then this is gonna be on earth. So we're using 9.8. So first thing I need to do is take two seconds divided by two pi. Uh, it ends up really just one over pi. I'll go ahead and just do that. Um, is equal to square root of length over 9.8. Um, okay, so I square both sides. Okay, so that's one over pi squared uh, is equal to length over 9.8. And I multiply this by 9.8. So it ends up being length is 9.8 um, divided by pi squared. So uh, 9.8 divided by pi carat 2. And so this length actually ends up being 0 0.993. So pretty close to pretty close to one meter long. So you get a one meter long um, bob right there, you'll get a nice um, about one second click back and forth. And you have to get it probably just right in order to keep time over long periods. We'll skip this video here. Let's get back to where we were. Okay, um, in the real world, there's uh, energy that is lost, just like my pendulum in my classroom. Uh, does The amplitude does not stay the same. Um, keep in mind, though, that period and the frequency actually do stay the same because, the, remember, the amplitude does not affect the period, which in that case would not affect the period, um, the frequency. Um, so what exactly uh, is going on? Well, I have air friction, you know, uh, maybe internal energy absorption, if it is something like a mass spring system, that spring actually absorbs energy as it's stretched and compressed. So uh, mechanical energy is lost in, in oscillating systems. Uh, the term that we use for that is damping. All right, if energy is lost, then something is damped. And what would happen, you'd see the amplitude starting off like this, Mm -hmm, not like that. And the amplitude would then, apologize, would be less and less as time goes on. Now, we are not going to use this equation. Just know that there's an exponential decay. Um, so the key thing for you to know is that damping is when mechanical energy is lost out of the system. And that is, you know, an exponential decay in amplitude. 
actually using this and the time constant and all that stuff is not necessarily um, true. But you would have to identify, like, if I had a mass spring system like this, and I asked, and there was friction here, and you set it in motion, what would the amplitude look like over time? You'd get the idea that it starts off like this, and then it gets less and less. And you'd have to be able to either identify a graph showing that, or produce some kind of graph like that. Um, and that is, I've seen that on old AP exams, I've seen it on the current one. Uh, it's something that you need to know. Okay, um, so if it if that amplitude, let's say of this kid, is constantly losing because of air resistance, and he's a little kid, he doesn't know how to pump his legs, and actually grow his amplitude, which is a pretty unique, pretty neat thing. Um, so in order to sustain that periodic motion, that swing back and forth, um, you must do work because energy is being leaving the system. You must do work. I must apply a force, but like a good parent you must apply the force at the right time. So this is a good grandpa, right? He's applying a force right at the right time at the height of the swing as he comes back, all right? Um, you can do it very right, like grandpa is there, or you can do very wrong, like the mom is right here, all right? So at the maximum speed is not a good time to apply the force. So if you apply the force at the right time, all right, um, not like, you know, if the child goes back and forth, the period's every second, yeah, you want to apply that force every second or every three seconds or whatever it is. But if you apply it every half a second or every uh, quarter of a second, you know, that affects other things too. So when you actually apply the force at the right time, um, you get a continual uh, no loss of energy. Um, so everything has a natural frequency, a frequency that this pendulum wants to go back and forth in. Um, I, we'll get to this in sound. Sounds, every object has a natural sound that it produces. Um, but if I give it a force at the same frequency, as in if this pendulum goes back and forth, and I give it a, a force at that same frequency, that you know, same period, then I actually can drive it, all right? And, um... We call this a driving frequency here. I can actually, um, you know, keep it either keep it going or make it um, start going and grow the amplitude. Um, and so what happens is if I, if this goes back and forth, and I go now, push now, push now, push now, right, so on, uh, then I can actually get it to go higher and higher, right? Because when I when my external force frequency is equal to the actual frequency that it wants to oscillate at, then this is called a resonance. Um, so what happens is that um, the um, amplitude will grow. All right, the amplitude will grow. If this is a kid on swing, the kid will get higher each time. All right? if, and of course, it ought to be canceling out uh, whatever loss of energy is, but I could actually push more, and then it would actually keep on growing. Uh, although you never seem to get that kid that goes all the way around. Always wanted to as a kid, but never really, never really got there. Uh, sorry, this is also called the resonant frequency. And so it's a resonance that happens. We'll get back to this when we talk about sound also. Uh, here's a video, I'll turn down my sound a little bit here, here's a video of a bridge which resonated one time. Basically it got repetitive uh, winds and that created a resonance that actually grew and grew until it fully collapsed. This is the Tacoma Narrow Bridge, All right, a very famous bridge and incident that happened. 